But let's talk about the pieces and the parts and we're gonna start playing with your equipment now and then we'll actually go through the procedure. I'm not going to be able to show this handout as I'm talking. So I'm just telling you, as I go through and we talk about different things, you may wanna scroll through this handout to kind of keep up through what we're talking about, but I'm not gonna be able to leave it up as I talk. So, because I'm going to, let me stop my share. Let's start playing with your equipment, man. So right now, get out your blood pressure cuff. Let's, if you haven't taken it out of the bag and messed with it, let's learn about the pieces of the equipment. So get your blood pressure cuff out. And if you haven't attached them yet, we are gonna attach the bulb and the manometer and the whole bit. So let's play with and start to look and dissect your blood pressure cuff. So everyone get your stuff out there, start playing with it. Are you ready? Got it out? So the first thing we're gonna do, so you've got the cuff here. So here's the cuff. You'll notice there are two hoses that come out of the cuff. Let me back up here a little bit more. So two hoses that come out of the cup. And it does not matter what you connect to what. I try to match mine to what they had on their website, but it really doesn't matter. Essentially what's in here is the bladder. The bladder that has two hoses for the air. To one of the hoses, you're gonna to wanna to connect the, we'll start here with the manometer. So this is the pressure gauge or the manometer. So what I need you to do is take the rubber. If you've not done this, you need to take the rubber part here and push it over the little valve stem. And there really should be almost no gap between the end of the tubing and the, 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 where you're putting it. So in this case here, there's a little bit of screw threads on the bottom of the manometer. So there's a little gap there, but let's also then take the tubing and we need to push that onto the bulb valve. This is one where it takes a little force, but really you'll notice here, there's almost no silver between the hose and the, the bulb valve stem. So you wanna make sure that you take and you push and push and get it over that little stem and push it to where the rubber's all the way basically touching to the rubber thing. And that should still also be the same case with the manometer, even though there's a little bit of the screw threads that stick out. So let's forcefully push. And again, I have the bulb valve on the hose closest to the end and then the manometer, but it really does not matter. But in one sense, we've got the tubing connected to the manometer. We need to have tubing connected to the bulb valve. All right, and push that on. And again, once you've pushed it on as far as you can, have your partner help you because they're stronger than you are maybe. So anyways, let's do that. So I'm gonna have the instructors walk around and I'll come out there for a second. I wanna make sure everyone has attached the bulb valve and the manometer to the hosing connected to the uh, um, blood pressure cuff. All right, so we have assembled everything. So let's talk about the pieces and the parts. So let's start with the manometer to begin with. So let's talk about, look at your pressure gauge here. It's pretty straightforward. I would tell you this is the most sensitive piece of the equipment. So I know some of you, I've seen you shove things in your backpack and in and out. Try not to drop it. Be a little bit gentle with this piece, if you will. So when you're, though, the nice thing about the reason we go with this MBF instruments is that again, a couple of years ago, some student opened the bag and it flopped out and it bounced a couple of times. And then in, when we picked it up, the little needle was just swinging back and forth. So she called and uh, the instruments, they have a lifetime replacement. We didn't really tell them we dropped it, but we said it was broken. And then in the next week they shipped it out. So if any of this equipment breaks or has problems, you can contact the company and they're supposed to replace it. But do try to be careful with this, all right? Now let's talk about the numbers. This is where you're going to read to get your values, wherever that little pin is pointing value number wise is going to be the reading that you take. So let me ask you this, what are the units of blood pressure? When you use any sort of manometer or pressure gauge for blood pressure, we measure it in units of millimeters of mercury, which is kind of weird because there's no mercury in here, right? But think of the old time ones, there was a glass tube and there was some of that silver mercury and you pump it up and the mercury would rise up in the tube. And so that's how they would measure. No mercury on here, but realize these numbers, the units are in millimeters of mercury. Now, here's the deal. It doesn't do any good to take the reading and then get the wrong number off of here. So let's just be comfortable about what you're seeing. Look at the large numbers. The numbers that are actually printed go up every 20 millimeters of mercury, 20, 40, 60, 80, and so forth, all right? But let's look between maybe the 40 and the 60, okay? How accurate can you read? Well, between the 40 and the 60, can you see halfway between those two, there is a larger notch. And so that larger notch halfway between the 40 and the 60 is gonna be essentially the 50. It's 10 millimeters of mercury. So halfway between two sets of numbers, you're gonna have the value in between. So truly there goes 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, where the odd numbers are the ones that are halfway between the two with a large notch, okay? Which means then how much is each little notch worth? So there are five notches between a number and the big notch and another five numbers between that notch and the one above it. So every little notch is worth two millimeters of mercury. So when that pin is pointing directly at a number, it's gonna be an even number. You can only directly measure two millimeters of mercury for each little notch. 
Can you estimate halfway between two notches? Sure, you can. I'm not sure how accurate or that you really need to be that accurate, but generally understand, make sure you realize that whatever notch you're looking at, that you can interpret its value. It's every little notch is two millimeters of mercury from the number below it. Okay, so anyway, I'm not sure I did a good job explaining that, but hopefully you can kind of understand how to read through that. All right. All right. Well, well let me ask you this since we're looking on this as already, when I say, well, I'll come to that. Never mind. Okay, so put the manometer down. Sorry, I'm babbling. Monometer there. Let's talk about the other active piece here, the bulb valve. And this one I do want you to kind of hold and play with. There is kind of, a, I think, a better way of doing it than yet. So this bulb valve is essentially going to squeeze and put air into the bladder inside the cup. So we want to be able to push air in, but we also need to be able to let air out. And that's what this little roller knob is best. So really go ahead and practice this. The best way to hold it is to open up your hand and put the bulb valve comfortably in the palm of your hand, wrap your hand around, and then your index finger, see my index finger here and my thumb here, should be right across from this roller valve. And hold it so that you're looking straight down on the roller valve. So the roller valve is between your thumb and your index finger like this. Now, roll it clockwise. So I'm rolling it this way clockwise, okay, to the right, and until it stops. That locks it. So now all the air I put into the cuff stays in the cuff. To let the air out, I have to turn the roller valve counterclockwise. So if you turn it counterclockwise, then it will start to let the air out. The problem here is, is that there's kind of a sweet spot. So when you practice this, you'll notice you'll be turning, turning, nothing, nothing, and then pssst, it all leaves out at once. It takes really some fine motor skills to kind of just barely turn it right at the sweet spot to be able to control the rate of deflation. So remember, all the way to the right or clockwise, we'll lock it so that the air doesn't come out. To release the air, you start to rotate it counterclockwise to the left until it deflates at the rate that you want, okay? And you'll notice I can go from squeezing to deflating here because my hands are in a good position. Now, invariably, some of you just like to do things differently, and I see a lot of people that hold it like this. We're gonna hold it like that, and you do your squeezy, squeezy, and that's great, but then how are you gonna deflate it? Well, then they gotta do this kind of roll, move it up and do it down here. You know, fine, you can be yourself, but I think it was intended, instead of doing this whole up and down thing, just turn it around, man, hold it like this, and your fingers are right there, ready to go. So if you can get used to doing it this way, it's, I think, the way it was intended, and it, it's a lot easier to do. So hold it where the bulb valve is right there, okay? So let's see if this works. So let's take the cup for now, and I'll talk more about the pieces here, but let's wrap it around a couple of times. So take this and wrap it around where it's flat, and put your hand on it because it won't inflate unless you've got some pressure on it. I'm gonna hold my little pressure valve here so maybe you can kind of see, and I'm gonna lean on this. You can try this too. Let's take it and turn our bulb valve. And my hose is in the way there. I'm gonna turn this all the way to the right so it's closed off, and I'm gonna start squeezing. So you see the pressure gauge is going up there. And again, you have to kind of lean on it to keep the pressure up a little bit, but I've got some pressure in there. You'll notice it's staying there for the most part. Now to let the pressure out, I'm gonna take my fingers here and go counterclockwise. And I don't know if you can hear the hissing and see the pressure valve start to go down. Then it's going counterclockwise to kind of release the pressure. So clockwise, lock it, pump it up. Counterclockwise, fingers, Let's the pressure out. There you have it. That's how you work and operate a blood pressure cuff using the manometer and the bulb valve. Let's talk though about the actual uh, blood pressure cuff itself because this is the deal. You need to put it on the patient the right way. And let me try to lighten it up a little bit so you can see. Because here's the deal. Is this the outside or the inside? Is this the inside or the outside? You see where, and is this the top over here? Does it go like this? or does it go like this? So you need to you know, kind of get oriented to the blood pressure cuff. So let's start here. The marking you need to start with, the most important marking to orient everything is this circle with a line. This is the target arrow, if you will. This is going to be placed directly over the brachial artery. And that's, I'm gonna show you where that's at, but that's where you're gonna put the stethoscope. That's what you listen for is right over the brachial artery. So this needs to be on the outside of the arm here like this. This is not the right spot, but over the arm. And again, facing right where you're gonna put the stethoscope. So it needs to be on the side closest to where the stethoscope is gonna be, and it needs to be on the outside. And that's the marking. That's what's gonna go over the brachial artery that we'll show you, okay? So that's the outside of it, okay? So that's the first marking to know. You'll notice it's just to the side of the tubes there. The other markings, just so you realize, you'll notice your cuff says adult regular. So I'll just mention this now so you can kind of see. 
to be aware of that the cups do come in different sizes. So for example, here is an adult or a pediatric. And I'll show you just in terms of the difference in circumference for this. If you line that up there, you'll notice that it's about an inch less um, smaller in diameter than the adult regular. Compare that then to the adult large. So there's a large adult here. And then there's my adult regular there. And then here's the pediatric. So there are three different sizes with the difference in circumference in the arm. And it's kind of important. I'm gonna show you how to measure. And we're gonna use this white line here to make sure that you do have the right cuff size on there. But it's important because if your cuff is too large, then they give you an artificially low blood pressure reading. If the cuff is too tight, it barely wraps around before you even do the blood pressure, then the readings are gonna be artificially high. So it is important that you do have the right size cuff for your patient, okay? Now, having said that, your the ones that we made you buy are not exchangeable, so you're gonna have to use the adult regular. That works for most patients, but realize in the real world, there are patients where this cuff size might not be appropriate. So let's follow up on that. How do you know if it's appropriate? Well, remember how we said, we know this is the outside of the cuff because of the, of the line with the circle. In. Okay, so if I lift that up, look over here that you can see on the very edge of your cuff, it's got this white line. You hold this up and then if you pull the cuff around, normally you're gonna wrap this around the patient's arm. You'll notice on the inside, there's this range. It's got an arrow with the range, okay? That's really the only main thing printed on the inside. As you wrap this around the arm around and come to lift up, you're gonna watch where that line is. So if you wrap it this all the way around, then you can see that this cuff is way too big because the line is not inside the range. But if you, anywhere around here, before you wrap it over, that would be okay. But if you can barely get this cuff around, I mean, by the time you're right around here, you can see that your edge is not within the range. So as you pull this around the patient's arm, for it to be the right size, this white line will be somewhere within this range. So when you do this, you'll kind of make sense. But that's what this range marking on the inside is. So that when you wrap it around, watch where the white edge of the end ends up. And it should be somewhere right around there before you flip over the Velcro. Okay. If you're over here, that's too small. If you're way over here, that's way too big. Okay. That's really it. That's all I got to say about the blood pressure cuff. So again, markings here, you got your manometer and you got your pressure valve. All right, let's set these aside and move on to your stethoscope. Grab your stethoscope. There's some pieces and parts we want to talk about with that. All right, I need to remember to score you in this. All right, got your stethoscope. Let's talk about some pieces here. First of all, let's start at the end here. Uh, hold this up a little bit higher. Talk about the tips. So you're going to put your ear tips. This probably came with ear tips already attached, these silicon ear pieces. Now, I think there was another size, a smaller size that came in the box. Don't lose those. We're going to talk about there are three things. But to be honest with you, the hardest part about blood pressure is that the sound that you're listening for is really soft. It's a little ta, 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 ta. And again, sometimes it's hard to hear. One of the three things that we can try to make sure you maximize your chances to hear it is to change these to maybe a smaller size. Because if these are too big for your ear, then they won't sit inside the ear far enough and you won't be able to hear very well. Most people, these work fine. So I'd leave them on there for now, but if you're having problems hearing it and the volume just is barely audible, then that's one of the things we can try to do is to change those ear pieces. So don't lose that other ear pieces. It may be something for you to actually try, okay? All right, so you've got these ear pieces here. Now, this is really important. Look at your things. When you put them together, do you notice that they don't come straight together, that there's, they're at an angle. Here we go. I'm going to show you there's at an angle. So when you go to put them in the air, this is important. So here's the, maybe you can see this here. So if I put these in the ear, you can kind of see that they're angling towards my nose. It's a 15 degree angle. They don't go straight together, but they're angling 15 degrees at this point towards my nose. Or should I put the stethoscope around my ears? Now you can maybe see that angle. If I put them in here, they're pointing towards the back. So they're going towards the back of my head. So should I put them in like this where they're angling towards the back? Or should I put them around like this so that the angle is going towards the front or towards the nose? It needs to be this way, towards the front. Your ear canals are not straight or you'd be able to see right through your head. They go forward toward, towards your nose. You want the sound to go towards your eardrums from the stethoscope. You don't want to send the sound backwards towards the back of the ear. You want it to go forward. So, so this is the number one thing. I would say the most important thing about whether or not you can't hear when you're trying to use your stethoscope is, did you put it in the wrong way? Because if you put them in backwards, you're not going to hear a thing. 
So whenever you go to put these in your ear, look down first and check the angle. Make sure they're angling forward towards your nose before you put them in your ear. That would be the number one cause of not being able to hear things right, okay? So that's the first part with that. The only other thing I would say about your stethoscope, so we got your earpieces, we talked about the angle, is that they need to be fit firmly in your ear. They, they don't want them loose and dangling, but you also don't want it to be so tight that it's pressing your ears and you can actually sometimes hear your own pulse. If it's too tight in your ear, then you're gonna hear your own pulse because it's squeezing your head. So there is a piece of metal inside this little neck rough piece right here. So all you need to do is to kind of pull it away a couple of times, bend it like this, and that'll kind of open it up, loosen it up a little bit. If it's too loose, then just go the opposite way. Kind of go this way a couple of times and that'll make it a lot tighter. So you can kind of open it or tighten it until it fits snugly, but not too tight or uncomfortable in your ears. So make sure you've got that set that fit works best for you, okay? That's really all this part. So let's set that out. Let's talk about the working end of the stethoscope. You've actually, we've made you buy a pretty good stethoscope, meaning pretty good because it's got two different heads on the end of it. So the, the, the wider one is the one that we call the diaphragm. It should, you should have hopefully a cool little KU monogram on here, but one side is called the diaphragm. The other side that you can listen from is called the bell. The smaller side is called the bell. Why do you want two different sides? Because it turns out the stethoscope conducts sound slightly different depending on whether it's a high frequency or a low frequency sound. So the diaphragm works best, this wider part here works best for high frequency sounds. What is a high frequency sound? A high frequency sound is when the doctor, let's see here, uh, let me stand over here, puts this on your chest and says, breathe in, and they put it on your back, breathe. Lung sounds, breath sounds and lung sounds, when you're listening to the lungs, those work best with the diaphragm because it's a high frequency sound, all right? Well, what about the cardiologist? The bell is used by cardiologists because they would put that over the chest here and listen for the heartbeat. So when you listen to the love dub, love dub, the S1, S2, S3 heart sounds, heart sounds work much better with the bell, all right? So lung sounds with the diaphragm, uh, heart sounds with the bell. What about blood pressure? That's the whole point for you guys, right? Blood pressure. I will tell you either. Use the one that works best. They conduct sound slightly differently. And so some of you will have be more successful with one or the other. I would tell you from my experience, it's about 65% of students do better with the diaphragm. The diaphragm is pretty sensitive. And it also is a little more forgiving on location because it's got a wider area. You can be off a little bit and still be able to hear it, okay? So there's some advantages. The disadvantage is, is that any movement at all and you'll be able to hear it. So it, it'll cause problems. So the diaphragm, I would say more than half prefer that, but here's the deal, the bell, people that struggle with the diaphragm, the bell often helps them a lot. So there are a lot of people that say, I can definitely hear it better with the bell. So let me ask you, on the test, you can use either side. How will you know which one is better for you? You gotta try it. So today you've got three people you're practicing on, try it with the diaphragm. And then the next time you do it, try it with the bell. If you don't like it, go back to the other. So you're gonna have to go back and forth and for yourself, find out the side that works the better. But truly, trust me, even if you hear it just fine with the diaphragm, you think, try the bell or the opposite bell, try the diaphragm because you may find one that definitely seems to be better for you. All right, now tune back in. This is, I know I've lost some people here, but. I said your stethoscope can conduct sound from either the bell or the diaphragm, but here's the answer. Not at the same time. So the number one problem, and then the, the, the second most common problem for why you can't hear anything is that you're using the bell, but you've set the stethoscope to work on the diaphragm. So you need to know which of these two your, your stethoscope is set to have the sound from. So how are you gonna know? Turn it around, look at your thing until you can see See, a dot, there should be, mine's a green dot right here. The green dot on the base there lines up with whatever side is active. So since my green dot is right here, that means the bell is active. Watch this, if I want to use the diaphragm, all I have to do is twist, see the head twists? And now it's a little harder to see, but the dot is underneath the diaphragm. Okay, so now if I turn it again, then I've lined up the bell with the dot. So remember, to get it to work, you need to set opposite on the same side as the dot, whichever side that you want to use, okay? So well, let me, last thing, that's really all I got to say, but I'm telling you the number one problem we have are students saying, I can't hear anything from the stethoscope. So when you go to use your stethoscope, 
The first thing you do before you put it on, look here to make sure it's angled towards the nose. So first step, look and make sure it's angled correctly. Secondly, look at the dot. Actually, look on the dot, take a second, and here's the deal. With this in your ear, very lightly, and I'm going to have you practice here in a little bit. Right now, actually, very, trust me, lightly, tap. With it in your ear, tap very lightly on the diaphragm, and see if you can hear it. Turn it to the bell even, and then do a little tap and see if you can hear it from the bell. So I'll give you a second here. Try to put them in your ear and see if you can hear sound from both sides by lining up with the dot, whatever side you want to have active, okay? Trust me to do it lightly. But if you do that little sound check, then when you go to take the blood pressure, you'll know that at least your stethoscope is set right and you should be able to hear correctly. So I'll give you a second to kind of play around with that stuff. Do it lightly, trust me, especially with the diaphragm. Right. Any questions or problems and things like that, let us know, but hopefully you're okay with that. That's the parts of the stethoscope. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is let me switch back and share some content quickly. All right, so hopefully you can see this now. Now, what we're gonna do, we've gone through the pieces. So here's the blood pressure cuff. We talked about that. We've talked about the stethoscope. So now, before we pull it all together, you need to understand about the sounds, what you're listening for and when you should expect to hear it. And this is kind of important to kind of understand this or you won't be able to get the readings correctly. So for, before Judy comes in, Judy didn't have to come quite yet. Let's just clarify the two pressures. So the one thing is the, there are two pressures. When you measure somebody's blood pressure, you're going to be measuring both the systolic and the diastolic pressure. Keep in mind, systolic pressure is the pressure when the heart beats and it's ejected all of the blood from the ventricles into the cardiovascular system. And so that's the peak blood pressure. But when the heart relaxes during diastole, then the pressure falls as the blood fills into the heart. So the lower pressure is the diastolic pressure. It's the pressure when the heart's at rest. The systolic pressure is the high pressure when all the blood has been pushed into the system. So systolic, diastolic, there are two pressures. When you do this technique, you're gonna to report to the patient both of those pressures. You're gonna say your systolic pressure was this, your diastolic pressure was that, okay? So with that in mind though, I want to, you know, Judy's gonna show you, we're gonna use, instead of using a stethoscope, we're gonna use a Doppler ultrasound here in a second. And Judy's gonna show you how you can determine systolic pressure, not the diastolic, but specifically the systolic. And you all should hopefully be able to hear it uh, and 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 see it with the pressure gauge. So with that, let me mask up here and switch. Stop this here. Okay. With that, this is the Doppler ultrasound with the probe that I'm going to use. And Judy is going to attach the blood pressure cuff. So she's going to match, and we'll show that a little more detail. But she's putting that dot with the line right over the brachial artery. Wrapping that around, making sure that it's there. She's then going to apply ultrasound jelly since this is an ultrasound vascular probe, just like that. That was Judy, that wasn't me. I didn't make that sound. Sorry about that. So, so you can't even hear laugh. That's the problem. See, no one makes it do that. So, okay, I'll take that and see if you can show my thing. So, the, the advantage to this uh, ultrasound is that. So hopefully everyone can hear that. What you're hearing is the blood flow, the pulse going through my arm. So, so now Judy is going to start to pump the cover. See if you can point the pressure gauge the other way so they can see. So she's pumping, but the blood is still flowing. At some point, the pressure in the cup will exceed the pressure of my blood pressure, and there will not be any blood flow. So now the pressure in the cup has exceeded my blood pressure, so blood cannot flow in the arm. She's now going to slowly release the pressure from the cup, and it's this. So you'll notice at that lower pressure then, Lost the signal there. If you hear the tapping, each heartbeat taps. 
So that's the idea. And as Judy was it, remove the cup, is that what you're using is called a signal mammometer. Signal mammometer. Because signo means pulse. For Latin, it's Latin for pulse. So basically, you are measuring the pulse is what you're listening for and using that to actually measure the blood pressure. So, and uh, appreciate your patience. Maybe that was a long way to walk for that, that idea behind that. So let me uh, just switch cameras here again. All right, do this. Uh, here. All right, so going back to this diagram here, this is kind of important, two main ideas. You're gonna hear the pulse on your stethoscope, unlike my Doppler Pro, where we could hear the blood flow without any pressure in the cuff. Here's the take-home message. You, when you put the stethoscope, every year somebody just, I watch students put the stethoscope over the brachial artery and listen, and they're trying to hear that ta, ta, ta sound. With a stethoscope, you cannot hear it. You can only hear, why am I still having this on? You can only hear it when there is disruption in flow. So think about this. If there's no disruption in the flow, you cannot hear the pulse. So if you start with that blood pressure cuff at zero and then you pump it to 10, have you exceeded the diastolic pressure yet? No, 20, no, 30, no. So you're gonna pump it up, pump it up, pump it up. You could still hear it. You wouldn't hear anything until you meet at least the diastolic. When the pressure in the cuff is above diastolic, then you're creating enough pressure to disrupt the flow of the blood through the arm. And you can then start to hear it. So between diastolic and all the way up to systolic, you could hear that thump, 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 thump. But when your pressure exceeds systolic, then the cuff pressure is too tight and blood can't flow at all, so you have no sound. So the only time you'll hear a sound is when the pressure in the cuff is somewhere between systolic and diastolic. Below diastolic, it's quiet. Above systolic, it's quiet. The only time you hear a sound is between diastolic and systolic, all right? The other thing, the reason in terms of why we take the blood pressure the way we do is that when you squeeze the cuff, you increase the pressure by five to 10 millimeters. It takes big jumps up because that bulb, when you squeeze it, is not precise. It just pumps a lot of air in. So you get these large jumps up. They're not accurate to take a reading. But once you go above the systolic, remember if you're higher than systolic, then there's no sound. You can very carefully regulate the deflation. So you can deflate at a nice, slow, constant rate. So if you're above systolic, there's no sound. You release the pressure, you release the pressure, it's slowly deflating. So, oh, I hear something. The first sound you hear during the deflation will be systolic pressure. And as it goes below systolic, you'll be able to hear it. I can hear it, I can hear it, I can hear it. You can hear it all the way until the, the pressure deflates to below diastolic. So when the sound disappears is the diastolic pressure. Now, I'm not sure I did a great job explaining that, but remember, you inflate up past systolic, you deflate slowly and consistently. The first sound is systolic, then you can hear it until the sound goes away and that pressure is diastolic, all right? So we're gonna practice this, A, to make sure that you understand what's going on. And then secondly, we want you to, you know, have some eye ear coordination because you have to be looking at the pressure gauge with your eyes and listening with the stethoscope with your ears. And when you hear a thing, you've got to read the reading. You gotta know what the number was. And when the sound goes away, you need to be able to know where the pin was and be able to take the reading. So it's not quite as easy as you think. So we're, I got some practice patients who we're gonna practice on. So you can use your hand out just on the backside or somewhere on the margins, write some of these numbers down. So give me a second here to try to share my video thing. Oh. All right, are you ready here in a second? Let me see, I'll pull the first one up and see if I can stop it here before it goes too far. All right, so in a second here, you are going to attempt to watch this pressure gauge and the very first sound you hear as it deflates will be the systolic. The last sound, when it, the sound goes away, would be the diastolic. So are you ready? And remember, this is about accuracy. I'd like to see you get within about two millimeters of mercury of the correct answer. All right, so I challenge here. I'm gonna, this is a challenge.
Did you get it? I love this first one because A, it takes it long enough that I've already lost my ADHD people by the time the sound comes around. And then secondly, it's pretty quick, right? You really do need to be intently looking and listening at the same time. Since I want you to do this accurately within one little notch, plus or minus my key, uh, let's do that one one more time. Now that you know what to expect, let's try it one more time and then I'll give you the answers and see how well that you did. All right, so you're going to self grade yourself, but this is an important reflection. Did you get here we go? Were you close within two millimeters of mercury to 84 for the systolic over 66 for the diastolic? So it was 84 over 66. Sound started at 84, went away at 66. Okay, we'll do a little couple more practices. Now, what's your interpretation, doctor? Is that a good blood pressure, bad blood pressure? We'd say a normal blood pressure is what? Normally, on average, the 120 over 80. So systolic of 120, diastolic of 80 is kind of an average. So clearly, an 84 over 66 is a low blood pressure. Now, that might be normal for them. And that's what made many of you, the younger, healthier, athletic people have lower blood pressures. That would maybe be a good thing. But if this was an older person whose blood pressure doesn't normally run that low, this could be the sign of something. So that is definitely would be considered a low blood pressure. All right. Accuracy. Let's try number two. You ready to do it again? Let's do it, do it, do it. All right, how'd you do on that one? Did you get 124 over 86? 124 over 86 would have been spot on. And again, if you're within two, above or below, that's great. If you're within 10, dude, no, we got to do a little better than that. So try to get a little bit closer. Doctor, what's your interpretation of that? Obviously, that's pretty much right at normal at 124 over 86, 120 over 80. So that's a normal blood pressure. Okay, let's do another one. This one's a little different. Let's see how you do on this one. Oh, that was weird. What did you get on that one? Okay, that was a little strange, right? Did you get though the first sound or the systolic was right around 104? So 104 for the systolic, but then you'll notice the diastolic never seemed to go away. So what did you get for the diastolic? Did you get zero? No, that wouldn't make any sense. So there's a problem with this one. Something was going wrong. How could you hear a pulse that wasn't the patient's? Because clearly the patient's holes, their diastolic didn't go all the way down to zero. We talked about one thing where if it was this way, sometimes you can hear the pulse in your own ears. Do you remember what I said that was? If your stethoscope is too tight. So again, if the stethoscope is too tight in your ears and it's pushing in your ears too much, then you can actually feel or hear your own pulse. So in this case, you'd have to retake that. The 104 is probably accurate, but we did not get any sort of accurate reading for the diastolic. Okay, two more. Let's do it.
All right. So what did you get for that one? Did you get 146 over 102? 146 over 102 was the exact values I was looking for. Uh, interpretation of that, that's elevated. That's a high blood pressure. Normally we want for most people, certainly less than 140 over 90. So that value is definitely somewhat elevated. So I'd say that's a high blood pressure. Okay, last one, little piece de resistance. Let's see how you do with this last one. Let's see if we can get this one perfect. All right, how many of you took your eyes off the prize there? That was kind of a different one, though. It was a little bit tricky. So let's see what happened here. Did you at least get the first sound? The first sound started around 150. It was pretty high. So it started about 150 and then disappeared at 136. So it was 150, then disappeared at 136. But the point is, and I don't know if you've noticed, I've been waiting to say anything until the pressure gauge pretty much goes all the way to zero. So you stay your focus during the entire thing because it came back. Now, here's the deal. Were you guys still watching? If you got this one, you did a good job. Did you notice that it came back at about 106? So it reappeared at 106 and then disappeared again for the last time at 82. And so what this shows is illustrating is what they call an oscillatory gap. Sometimes there's some hardening of the artery so that at certain pressure ranges, they just don't vibrate. So they don't conduct the sound. So there's this deadening. So what happened is you heard the first sound, but part of the way through, the, just, the sound was deadened and you couldn't hear it but it came back at a lower pressure and so forth. The final interpretation of this patient's blood pressure would be the very first sound you hear would be 150 over 82, which would be that last sound. So it just goes to show a couple of things. Watch or, and listen the entire range. Don't stop paying attention just because you think you got your answer. So make sure you listen through the whole range. Secondly, did you notice some of the, the sounds or some of the blood pressures, you could hear kind of a difference in quality, sometimes more of a sloshy sound, maybe sometimes more of a tapping sound. They say it sounds like that. I never hear that. To me, I'm barely able to hear a tap, 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 tap. So if you hear a thumping of any quality and of any volume, it's there. If there's no tapping, then it's not. So it's just tapping or no tapping. And the last thing is you're going to see here when you practice in a little bit, that sound volume is totally unrealistic. It's a very soft sound such that we need to try to be as quiet as we can in lab as you're practicing because it's a soft sound. And that's why some people will struggle more than others because it's not something loud to listen for, even if you kind of know what you're listening for. So, well, there we have that. So let me minimize that. Switch this back. Were you guys able to see that? It said something about being paused. Hopefully, Judy or somebody else, I hope you all saw that. Oh, I'd be so sad. Anyways, let me go back to here. Hopefully, I can see this now. So we've talked about the sound thing. So at this point, we're about ready to pull it all together in terms of putting the cuff on and going through the whole process and the procedure. All right. Before we do that, there's two things I want to bring up. Part of the procedure, and it's an important part, will be to be able to take your patient's pulse. And we're going to be taking a radial pulse. And it's called a radial pulse because you're going to be using the radial artery that you can kind of hopefully see in this image here to be able to measure this patient's heart rate, okay, and feel their pulse. So let's have you practice on yourself to begin with. You'll eventually have to do this on a patient. So let me hit stop. I'm not, uh, stop there. So let's see if I can kind of show this up here. So take your hand. You're going to take your hand here and let's identify where the radial artery is on one of your arms. First of all, understand. So if this is kind of the midline of my arm, the radial artery is on the thumb side. In fact, it's closer to the thumb, not the pinky. Okay, this is always a problem. So if you look at the middle here, it's up. It's not in the middle, it's here. So follow your thumb down. Actually, if you follow the thumb down and just the bend, the past the bend in the wrist. So if you see kind of the lines where my wrist bends here, you're going to be just a little bit further than that. Now, to feel the pulse, it's best to avoid your index finger because it can have its own pulse. So it's best to use your middle finger. Although I did have actually a student yesterday who could not feel it with the middle finger, but could feel it just fine with the index finger. And it has maybe to do with some sensitivity between your fingers. 
Ideally, try to do it with your middle finger. If you're having some problems, if you're trying to learn how to do it, use your index finger for now. We realize it's best to avoid that. And so what you need to try to do, and it's impossible to see it, but there's the bend in the wrist and on the upper side, and I kind of walk around. There's kind of a valley. I can feel kind of a ligament here and the bone is over here. So between the bone and the ligament, if I kind of push down on that, I can feel a thump, 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 thump. So you should be able to feel the pulse on the thumb side here. Notice I'm on near the top of my arm here on the thumb side, past the bend in the wrist, between the bone on top and the ligament down there. And again, some people I will see will be able to kind of just lay their fingers across. And some people are much more sensitive. If you can feel it that way, that's great. I, like I said, maybe I've got issues, but I usually have to take my fingers and kind of angle them a little bit and push in. You don't have to push in hard, hard, but you need to depress firm enough to be able to feel the pulse. So right now in my middle finger, I can definitely feel my pulse. And notice where I am on the hand. Now, if you've been doing that, switch to your other hand. See if you can go back and find the other pulse. So try that real quick. See if you can put your hand out there, come down past the bend in the wrist, use your middle finger. So right there, I can feel my pulse in that hand. And that's the radial pulse. So there are anatomical differences. I will tell you, you know, my blood pressure is a little bit higher. I usually don't have any problem feeling mine. Judy, who Dr. Wu out there has lower blood pressure. And I'm telling you, if you have a nice to her, she may let you try to find it, but it's the soft. It's, I have a hard time feeling hers just because her blood pressure is a little bit lower. So again, there's gonna be some anatomical differences. So this would be a great thing. Today, you're gonna to practice on three different people. Now, when you go home, the more people you practice on, the easier and faster it is to do it. And I know that because every year during the test, I'll put my hand out there. And somebody goes here and then here. And then they start walking and they're walking and they're walking and they don't have any clue where to go. All right, so I know it's supposed to be up here by my thumb. So again, practice on people. If it's this hand, then again, you're gonna be up here on the thumb side, not down here on the pinky side. So practice and get used to where to do that, all right? So now that's the pulse. Well, hopefully you're okay with that. You'll be able to practice it and we'll say why that's so important. Let's try, and this is gonna be harder. I didn't do this yesterday, but it was, questions got brought up about the brachial artery. So let's see if you can kind of, I'm trying to come a little bit forward here. The, where is the brachial artery? I'll show you my hand here. We said that the radial artery is on the thumb side here. The brachial artery is where we're gonna tell you to put your stethoscope. You want the stethoscope over the brachial artery. You find the brachial artery by following the pinky. This is where it gets confusing, I understand that. But you follow the pinky up, past the bend in the arm. So here's my elbow here. So that's where it's bending there. So the brachial artery is going to be on the pinky side, just above the bend in the elbow. The problem is, and you can try to push it, but you really have to kind of go down and in a little bit. It's kind of under the bicep muscle. So I can feel mine right here. Uh, it's like a little bit closer, but where my fingers are now, I can feel my pulse. So again, if you look at that, it's on the pinky side, not my thumb side. So you can try this on yourself, go up past the bend in the arm, and then kind of push in and down, maybe under the muscle a little bit to where if you can feel the pulse. And don't push hard on when you want to injure yourself because it is not an easy one to feel. The radial artery, you should be able to feel. And that's why you're going to take the pulse from it. But this is the area. So again, when we talk about the stethoscope, we're going to want to go not midline, but towards the pinky. So midline towards the pinky right in around here is where I'd want to put my stethoscope head, not over on the thumb side. But the thumb side is where the radial artery is, okay? So I know that can be confusing, and that's definitely part of what we need to practice today. So if you're having any issues or problems with trying to do that, uh, let us know, okay? So with that, let me go ahead, and I'm going to show you a video of the blood pressure procedure uh, taken by uh, two, um, it, that kind of goes through how to cite the same thing I just did a little bit with how to cite the brachial artery. And then it'll go through the techniques, not exactly the same way we're gonna have you do it, but it's a really good, I think, video to kind of see a different way of doing it. Plus the guys talk with this English accent, which is totally cool. So let's watch that. And then I'll have Judy come in here and we'll walk through the rubric and kind of go step by step on what we want you to do. But this is a good example. Now, saying I need to make sure I'm, Everything okay? Okay. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So to locate the brachial artery, the easiest way is just to draw a line up the pinky, above the bend of the elbow. And that's where you'll position your cuff arrow. And that's also where you'll place your diaphragm and your stethoscope. 
just draw an arrow up the pinky, and that's where you're going to find it. Up on the arm, this is the right arm. Draw a line up the pinky, and that's where the arrow will be placed. Okay. This is also where the diaphragm of the stethoscope will go, right here. You definitely don't want to put the diaphragm underneath the cuff. Try to get as much away from the cuff as possible. Hi, my name's Simon. I'm one of the final year medical students. Can I just check your name and age, please? Yeah, my name's Andrew, I'm 25. Nice to meet you, Andrew. Today, I'd like to take your blood pressure. So that will entail me taking this cuff, inflating it around your arm, feeling and listening to your pulse. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that's fine. It might be a little bit uncomfortable, but it shouldn't hurt. That's fine. Are you okay for me to go ahead? Yeah, lovely. Yeah. So just pop your arm on the table. That's lovely. Now we're going to measure it differently. We're going to use it and watch them. You'll watch the index when he wraps it around. It should be within that range. I'm just going to feel your pulse now. Remember the pulse will disappear at the systolic value. So that's why it's called an estimated systolic. That completes the procedure. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you. All right. So, okay. All right. So, we're going to go through that's very similar. And again, that video, he did a really good job of explaining what to expect and what he might, you know, might feel like and what he was going to do in terms of with the blood pressure procedure. So, that was good. But, and we're going to go something through very similar, but not exactly that. So, let's go ahead. And I want you to kind of be, I'm going to not have this up. I'm going to, we're going to do it live here on video, but make sure that you have and that you can see on your hard copy, the rubric. So let's go through the rubric for how we want you to actually perform the blood pressure procedure for us. Okay. So let me stop that. And then I have Judy come up here and we'll kind of stand here and we'll be our patient. And I will try to be the pharmacist. So here's the deal. I will tell you the first step of the rubric is where a lot of students will lose points because it's memorization. You need to remember. Before uh, I take your blood pressure, I need to ask you some questions. Now, what you know are these questions are all designed to bring up things that might have artificially increased your blood pressure. So listen to these questions and see if they make sense as things that might give her an artificially higher blood pressure than normal. So let me ask you, have you taken any medications today? No. Okay. Have you consumed any caffeine? No, I don't drink coffee. Okay, no coffee, no caffeine. Have you used any tobacco or nicotine containing products? I don't smoke either. How about exercise? I've been sitting around more than minutes. Okay, so, and then lastly, can you tell me what does your blood pressure normally run? Usually running at 100 over 70. 100 over 70, mm -hmm. all right. There you have it. That's step one. You didn't even have to do anything. But what do all those things, what do, what do certain medications, caffeine, nicotine, uh, in the form of tobacco and exercise do to your heart rate? Those can all increase heart rate, which is going to increase cardiac output and therefore potentially increase blood pressure. So had they just exercised or had they just had a Red Bull, then their heart rate is going to be up. Maybe you know that feeling. And their blood pressure is going to be higher. So again, you just want to know that. 
What does her blood pressure normally run? Doesn't really change anything about the procedure, but it gives you a little bit of an idea of what to maybe expect. So it's kind of helpful to know if they're at a high baseline to begin with or not. Judy's maybe, for example, here is on a little lower baseline. So it just lets me kind of know that as I go into the procedure. All right. Now, step two on the thing says to position the patient. Now, you, all the patients will be sitting down. The big thing on this, you want your patient sitting with their legs uncrossed, feet flat on the floor, back straight. So you don't want them slouching, but you also don't want their legs crossed. You're then going to have your patient come over here, and we're going to want to rest their arm. Let me maybe darken this up a little bit. Rest their arm kind of on the supported on the table, and we would like it to be at the level of the heart. So the blood pressure cuff here is going to be on the level of her heart. Okay, so she's there. Step two, position the patient. Step three has to do to put the blood pressure cuff on. So let me read it just so you think. You're going to put the blood pressure cuff on where the line artery mark is over the brachial artery. You also want that bottom edge of the cuff to be two to three centimeters, which is about an inch above the bend in the arm. Okay. So with that, I would take my blood pressure cuff. Here. And open it up and let's see, inside, outside, what am I looking for? Oh, there's the circle with the line. So what I'm going to do is remember, there's the pinky. I'm following the pinky on up and there's the bend in the arm. So about an inch above, kind of on the pinky side, that's where I'm thinking the brachial artery is going to be. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to start by putting the cuff open like this, line up with the dot, with the circle. And with this hand, I'm going to hold it steady when I reach around and pull the cuff tight below there. And as I pull it tight, I want to just basically get it to touch evenly with the with the Velcro so that it flops over, okay? So that's the way to do it. Now, here's the problem. If you don't do it right, here's a couple of ways to do it wrong. What's wrong with that? You see where the circle is moved. So you want the circle to be over the inside of the brake artery. If I do that and then put it on like this, that's good, but look, it, 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 it's too loose. That's no good. It needs to be on there firmly and tightly. So again, and the other thing that's wrong is to do it like this, to where it's not an angle. So you need to make sure that when you line it up, you get the circle there, hold it steady, so that when you pull it tight, it's on there firmly and nice and easy. Okay? That's how you put it on. Again, about, about an inch above the bend in the arm. Now, one thing we didn't talk about is that, uh, let me see if you can kind of see this here. There's a notch, there's a little notch in the fabric on your cuff. It's designed for you to take the manometer and then you'll notice there's a clip on the back. So you can actually kind of go through there and clip that on there and that's where it can hold the, the pressure gauge. And feel free to try to do that. That works well unless that happens and then you can't see it. So you can try to fold this in a couple of times and do that and that might work. So that's okay. But then again, if it tilts to where you can't see it, then that's no good either. We're fine on the test. So to be honest with you, what most people do on the test for us is not to use that notch and either just press it on the counter where you can see it. So again, I know you can't see it, but so I can press it there where you can see it. And darken it up again. Or if you can kind of see, it's just that have your patient say, can you hold that pressure gauge for me? Can you hold that? And so just have your patient hold it so that you can see, okay? So there you have it. So now we're ready to go. But I'm not gonna have my patient hold it for now. I've just put the cuff on. That was step three. What is step four? obtain the pulse rate. So now that I've put the cuff on, I'm ready not to take the blood pressure and I'm going to do the pulse. So this is where I'm going to take here and I'm going to use my middle finger. There's the thumb, there's the bend in the wrist. So I would come right over here and push down on it. And I think you can feel it today. That's pretty good. How long, I didn't talk about this. How long do you count? You count the heartbeats, one, two, three, four, for 15 seconds. We want you to do it for at least 15 seconds. The value is reported in beats per minute. So you would take whatever number you get. So if I measured 15 beats in 15 seconds, then I'm gonna multiply that by four and say that her pulse rate is 60 beats per minute. If I do this and I count 20 beats in the 15 seconds, then her heart rate is gonna be 80 beats per minute. So count for 15 seconds, multiply by four. On the test, as soon as you're done doing that, you can take the piece of paper and write your answer down. So you don't have to memorize it. Or calculated right there, but you're going to want to take the pulse, write the number down, and be able to tell the patient there later. Okay, so we have taken the pulse. That was step number four. Step number five is now to estimate the systolic. Because here's the deal I do not know how high to pump up the blood pressure. Remember, we take blood pressures by going above systolic and then deflating down. So, how high do I know to do this? Okay, well, most people, let's just go up to like 250. Would that be okay? 
Why would Judy not be my friend anymore if I pump this up to 250? Oh. It's very uncomfortable. So we don't want to cause more discomfort than we need. So here's what I know is that here's the deal. If I can feel her pulse here, would you agree that means that blood is flowing through her arm? But if I pump up the cuff and my pressure starts to exceed systolic, will I be able to feel the pulse anymore? No, the pulse will disappear when the blood pressure cuff equals systolic pressure. So what I'm going to do then is you can hold that there at this point. I'm going to take my bowl valve and I'm going to close it off. I'm going to feel the pulse again. Okay, I can feel it. So I squeeze and I squeeze and I squeeze. And you can see the pressure gauge starting to go up. It's about 60. I can still feel it. I can still feel it. I can still feel it. But now watch. If I do a squeeze, it jumps up a lot, it went away. But that was a big jump. So now I know I've exceeded it. So I'm going to use my valve here and I'm going to slowly release the pressure until I can feel it again. So just as a quick reminder here, to take an estimated systolic, you start with zero, you find the pulse, you pump and pump and pump until the pulse goes away, and then slowly release the pressure until the pump, the pressure comes back, right? The pulse comes back. The value at which the pulse comes back would be her estimated systole. So for on duty, I kind of came back at around about 94, I thought. So about 94 is what I estimate. So now I'm ready to take the pressure, but that's an estimate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pump the cup up to 30 millimeters above the estimated systole. So if you go down, to, um, well, we'll get to that here in a second. So again, I'm ready to do it. I know her estimated was about 96. Do you realize now step six is the first time we need to use our stethoscope? So here's the problem with some of you. You put this in your ear right away. So you put this in and then it's dangling down here and it gets in your way. So what is the coolest way that Judy would have her stethoscope on? All right there, well, you can't see nothing. See this video thing doesn't work. All right, sorry guys. Have this around your neck. So have it around your neck like this. That way when you're ready to use it, you can pull it off your neck and use it. So again, I'm now ready to put my stethoscope in. So I'm going to look at the angle, put that in the right way. I'm going to look here and make sure my dot is lined up. In this case, if I want to do the bell, my dot is lined up right there with my bell. So I'm good to go. All right. Now, this is where we said we're on the inside, the pinky side above the bend in the arm there, just barely. I'm going to hold this. Watch it. This is just kind of a helpful tip. So between your index finger and your middle finger, hold it with the tubing on top. So I've got it so that it angle down, but between my fingers, because now watch, I can come over here like this, put it over, but my thumb, I know you can't really see it, but my thumb is going behind her arm and I can get a nice firm. I can kind of squeeze it. I don't have to squeeze hard, but I've got a nice firm grip on it, okay? And it's comfortable. So kind of a grip like this. With my fingers, I'm gonna squeeze down like that. So I'm gonna put that right over there like that. Squeeze it nice and, and firm, so it's just on there nice and flat. Then in my dominant hand, I've got my bowl valve and I can see the pressure gauge. And at this point, I can hear. So I'm going to close off the valve and I squeeze 30 millimeters over my target. So since I was at 196, I'm going to go to 126. So I'm going to pump that up quickly to about 126, which I now know is over that. And then I slowly release the pressure. Uh, slowly release the pressure. Was that slowly? That was really fast. So again, the idea is to show you how to do it. You get up to where you want, and then you got to kind of just control. I'm hoping you can kind of maybe see the rate at which that's deflating that rate. And again, the first sound I hear was the systolic, and then the last sound I heard was the diastolic. So the first sound I heard was around 92, I think, and then it went away at around 64. So I would give her a 92 over 64 is my final reading, and your pulse rate was 80. So you, the last step I'm saying is the last step on this is to inform the patient. Now here's the deal. This is always what happens is you've got your patient there and you're doing this thing, and you're taking the reading and it's coming down and okay, there's the diastolic right there. And then you say, and you leave it right there, but there's still pressure in the cuff. So remember when you get your reading, let all of the pressure out of the cuff. It's uncomfortable for the patient. So remember when you're done with the reading, let all of the pressure out and let it go. Okay. The other thing I will tell you, and, well, okay, so and then you would remove the cuff from the patient and give them their uh, values and say, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Judy. So let me go back to uh, video. All right. Let's everyone look at my bib again. All right, guys. Well, we're almost ready to have you practice. 
Um, hopefully that was helpful. The one thing I will tell you on the exam, when we do this on the exam, we can see everything that you do. <laughs> to be honest with you, your patients will be one of your instructors. So we will be watching and knowing everything and where you put things, where you did the pulse and everything else. The only thing we can't verify for sure is what you hear in the stethoscope, all right? So what happens on exams, right? It's kind of a high stakes thing. You'll take it and maybe you don't hear it at all, but you don't wanna lose points. So after the test, you'll take the stethoscope off and you'll say, and your blood pressure was 126 over 82. I have a feeling they are making some stuff up. So here's the deal. On the exam, you will not be graded for the actual value you tell me, okay? Because I cannot confirm or deny what you heard. So don't lie. You will not lose any points. What I would hope that would happen, if you do all of this and everything's set up right, that you and you do the reading, but you don't hear anything, what would you do in practice? You would say, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to hear anything. Would it be okay if I do it one more time? And we'll say, yes, please do. So you wait just a couple of seconds and then you repeat it again, try it a second time. If you still don't hear it on the second time, say, I'm sorry, I still wasn't able to hear it. We'll say, well, that's fine. I thank you for trying. And again, you will not lose any points for not being able to hear the value. So you do not need to lie to us if you don't hear the value. There's no incentive to that. Because to be honest with you, I'll tell you, I've done this for a while. If you can't hear it, it's probably because you got the earpieces in backwards. They're going backwards instead of forwards, or you didn't change the head of it. There's usually a procedural reason that we picked up on it so very well. And trust me, sometimes we know people give us blood pressure readings when we know they could not have heard it. So there's, please don't do that. There's no reason or incentive to do that. The incentive is to do the procedure right. But if you, and again, some people, it really is hard to hear that sound. We'll work with you this week and next week. And, but again, we're not gonna, you won't lose any points on the exam because you can't hear that darn little sound. Okay, hopefully you can, and we'll get you through that.